For as long as I can remember, I have known that the world is not what we have been taught. My childhood belief in ghosts and Bigfoot is just the tip of the iceberg, and the more I've learned, the more I've wanted to know. Welcome to my attempt at figuring out what in the Sam Hill is going on out there. I'm going to start this episode off with a disclaimer. I've discussed some fairly brutal things in the past, but this is probably going to be my most graphic episode. I will do my best, as always, to discuss everything in as clinical a manner as possible, but the material is graphic regardless. If you have a weak stomach, please skip this episode. Seriously, mom, skip this episode. Research Log 32. Animal Mutilation. Animal mutilation is one of the things that really forces you to confront the fact that we don't know and aren't allowed to know what exactly goes bump in the night. No longer is it just some flashing lights in the sky or some oogie-boogie whispers on a tape recorder. There are real-world consequences. A farmer loses their crop, an animal dies senselessly and quite possibly painfully, hundreds of pounds of delicious burgers go to waste. Still, the fact remains that it is a serious subject for many farmers and ranchers, so much so that in the 1970s, when cattle mutilations were at their peak in North America, two senators pressured the FBI into investigating. The FBI was extremely reluctant to get involved and ultimately claimed they only had the jurisdiction to investigate cases that occurred on Indian reservations. This, of course, is ridiculous. The FBI investigates what it wants, who it wants, when it wants. If Wickard v. Filburn can decide that the Department of Agriculture can regulate the production of crops that never leave the state because of its effects on interstate commerce, the FBI can decide to investigate the slaughter of thousands of cows across numerous states. They chose not to. Welcome to government, where everything is made up and the rules don't matter. The FBI snipped a few newspaper clippings and wrote a few letters to placate the senators. Honestly, a research librarian would have done a much better job. Most of it is unreadable because it's a photocopy of a photocopy of a monkey's butt. But there are two pretty decent pieces of information in there. The first is a list of mutilations. It is by no means exhaustive, but it's a large enough sample size that we can see some patterns and some absences of pattern. There is no pattern to which animals are killed. Beyond all being cattle, the list includes bulls, steers, heifers, cows, calves, young and old, male and female, beef cattle, and dairy cattle. All have had their sex organs and or their rectum removed. Some also lost their tongue, eyeball, earlobe, lips, or some combination thereof. In addition, some had a circle cut around their navel. The other useful piece of information is an in-depth report by the New Mexico State Police regarding a cattle mutilation at the home of Manuel Gomez in Dulce, New Mexico, in April of 1978. The report is one of those super well-made photocopies of a photocopy that's hard to read anyway, and then they were kind enough to cut off half an inch on the right side of the paper all the way down. Thankfully, we can still get the gist of the information. We have an 11-month-old bull that has been mutilated. The animal was last seen less than 12 hours prior and was estimated to be dead around three hours. The rectum and sex organs were gone, the result of a, quote, sharp and precise instrument. The animal had visible bruises around the brisket, which is the front shoulder area. The investigator felt this was from straps used to raise and lower the bull from an aircraft, likely a helicopter. The only prints around the site were four-inch round tracks that imprinted into the dry ground more heavily than the tires of the police car. The investigator removed and examined both the heart and liver. Both were white and had a mushy consistency similar to peanut butter. Laboratory analysis showed some bacteria present, but nothing special for the heart. The liver was more interesting. Laboratory analysis of the liver, as compared to a healthy cow liver from a food market, showed the mutilated liver had no copper and had extremely elevated levels of phosphorus, zinc, and potassium. The blood extracted off of the liver was pink in color and did not coagulate even days later. The carcass appeared dehydrated, which is a pretty fast timeline only three hours after death. The skin was brittle and felt like some sort of paper, though which type he meant is cut off in the report. The investigator believed some type of radiation was being used that destroyed the red blood cells, and while he believed the radiation was not harmful to humans and reported no physical symptoms himself at his many mutilation investigations, he did report that seven people who visited this mutilation site complained of headaches and nausea. The animal was last seen alive at 8 p.m., a low-flying aircraft was heard around 3 a.m., The mutilated animal was found shortly thereafter, and the investigator was called around 7.30 a.m. 
There is a follow-up report from another mutilation of one of Manuel Gomez's cattle later, in June 1978, but it is pretty unreadable. Safe to say, though, that it really sucked to be Manuel Gomez in 1978. There are many aspects to this attack specifically, and animal mutilations in general, that interest me. It has always bothered me how much the mutilations remind me of the beginning stages of field dressing a deer. When I'm field dressing a deer, the first thing I do is tie off the rectum so that I don't contaminate the meat with feces while I work, because nothing ruins the joy of meat in the freezer like a case of dysentery. I played Oregon Trail as a kid. I know how that ends. Now, I don't go so far as to remove the rectum entirely. That's a key difference. Instead, I use a barbed butt plug to pull the intestines through the anus and tie it off with some dental floss. The next step would then be to remove the external sex organs of the male and then go in and remove the guts, at which point the process obviously stops in comparison. For these mutilated animals, the guts and vital organs are not removed and the meat is not processed. As you can see, the methods differ, but the rectum and the external sex organs are both targeted nonetheless. The other aspect that reminds me of my field dressing experience is the investigator's description of the heart and liver. I can say for sure that they are not white and mushy, naturally. Both are a deep red hue and pretty tough. The heart is obviously muscle, and the liver is quite sturdy as well. I have experienced that mushy peanut butter sensation, though, from a badly damaged lung. Not everyone agrees with this technique, but when I hunt, I'm always aiming for the heart and lungs just behind the front shoulder blade. It produces a quick kill if executed properly. And if you're careful while gutting the deer, it isn't until you puncture the diaphragm that you become a bloody mess. I also hunt with a wee little 243, so the carnage is pretty minimal. One time though, I hit it at just the right angle, I guess. The lungs exploded into an eviscerated goo. And every time I tried to grab the chunks of lung while I was gutting the deer, the chunks would just ooze between my fingers. This makes me wonder if some sort of percussive weapon is being used that might both bruise that front brisket area as well as cause organ damage. I don't know if just blood and tissue damage from radiation would cause such a drastic change in organ texture and structure, though I suppose a more narrow definition of radiation would be required first. The precise nature of the wounds in animal mutilations reminds me of my tonsillectomy. The wounds show surgical precision and a distinct lack of blood. Now, if the animal had already been exsanguinated, then I suppose any old surgical instrument would do. Then again, some mutilations show much more than just a flaying of the skin. Some actually show a clean removal of tissue down to the bone. And this is what triggers my memory. For better or for worse, I had my tonsillectomy rather late in life, at age 23. In some ways, this sucked quite a bit, because tonsillectomies are notoriously more rough for adults. In some ways, though, it was nice because I had access to newer and more advanced techniques. The type of tonsillectomy I had is called harmonic scalpel or ultrasonic scalpel. One of the difficulties of tonsil surgery is that you want to minimize the amount of blood going down the throat of the patient. The harmonic scalpel technique uses an instrument that vibrates at 55.5 kilohertz to both cut the tissue and close the wound at the same time. I can attest that I was able to heal much faster than if I'd done it old school with a cold scalpel and stitches. But when you watch the surgery, it looks like the harmonic scalpel is just melting away the tissue like it's a hot wire going through styrofoam. If there is a medical instrument that can create clean cuts and shave away precise layers of tissue without staining the hide with blood, I feel strongly that it would be a relative of the harmonic scalpel used in my tonsillectomy. The first harmonic scalpel technology didn't hit the market until 1988, well after the mutilation boom of the 1970s, but it wouldn't be the first time military and black ops had access to technology before the general public. In regards to the white organs, my assumption is that this would be due to the exsanguination, similar to how an animal suffering from blood loss would have white gums. There were no obvious puncture wounds that would hint at the method of exsanguination, but it's possible that the dehydration and papery texture of the skin obscured any puncture marks that would have been present. I'm still not sure what could have caused the structural damage to the organs, other than possibly a percussive weapon as I discussed previously, but I did come across a conference paper title in the medical literature that struck me as interesting. Vacuum-assisted exsanguination in the rabbit. I wasn't able to access the contents of the article, but it has me wondering if a vacuum-assisted method of exsanguination could both explain the speed of the mutilations and the structural damage to the internal organs. 
In regards to the unusual metal concentrations in the liver, I did find that hypocupremia or low copper is a product of liver failure. I also found that hyperphosphemia, high phosphorus, and hyperkalemia, high potassium are a product of hemolysis or the rupture of red blood cells. In the medical literature, this is typically seen in tumor lysis syndrome caused by chemotherapy, but there are other possible causes of hemolysis, including radiation in the range of 16 to 50 kilorads. I was not able to find an explanation of the high levels of zinc. In the medical literature, excess zinc is typically a cause, not an effect, so I'm not sure how or if it is related. As only one liver was analyzed, it's possible that it is a coincidence and the bull already had excess zinc. The healthy liver control was from a meat market, not a bull from the same herd with access to the same foods. So it's not an ideal control in that sense. I should also mention that excess zinc inhibits the uptake of copper, so it's possible that the high zinc and low copper levels are related. In regards to the pink blood, it's hard for me to draw conclusions since the blood came from the liver, which itself was white and mushy and could have contaminated the sample. A certain amount of hemolysis can cause pinkish blood, but it would also typically render the blood clearer than normal, which was not documented. Per the medical literature, you can also see pink blood in conditions like leukemia, where there is a high concentration of white blood cells, but I wouldn't expect that in this case where we're dealing with a very fast timeline. My belief is that these animal mutilations are the result of military testing of directed energy weapons. There are various types of directed energy weapons, but we know the military started testing DEWs in the late 1960s, and we know that some DEWs could produce the radiation necessary for hemolysis to occur. My belief is that the DEW would be directed at either the gonads or the anus, thus leaving no visible radiation burns on the skin when the area was later excised. I believe the sex organs, rectum, and blood would then be harvested for testing. Some in the ufology community believe the rectum is harvested to collect bacteria needed for alien technology. I am not convinced by this. In a healthy cow, the most prevalent types of bacteria found in the colon are Clostridium, Bifidobacterium, and Megaspheria. In a cow suffering from diarrhea, the most prevalent types of bacteria are Lactobacillus, Enterococcus, and Escherichia. None of those are found solely in cattle. The only benefit to cattle rectums that I can presume would be sheer volume, but I expect if that were truly the reason, cattle mutilations would have continued at a similar rate. Why would alien technology be most in need of bovine butt bacteria in the 1970s? Instead, what I found compelling is that rectal epithelial stem cells are actually quite sensitive to radiation. In fact, rectal epithelial radiation injury is a common side effect of pelvic radiotherapy in human patients. The rectum would thus be an ideal sample tissue if you were looking to study the biological effects of directed energy weapons, and it would explain why the colon and the rest of the digestive tract were not also harvested. Sadly, I believe this was probably done while the animal was still alive, which is why bruising and broken bones were present on some victims. Modern slaughterhouse techniques often involve a captive bolt stun gun, which pierces the brain with a metal rod to essentially make the animal brain dead followed by exsanguination, and even then, the animal's body, which is technically still alive, can kick and thrash until the exsanguination is complete, despite the brain being a vegetable. I believe a similar effect is probably what we're seeing in these mutilated cattle. One thing I want to mention, though, is that animal mutilations are not limited to cattle, and they're not limited to the 1970s. The so-called first case of animal mutilation related to the 1970s cattle mutilation boom was a horse in the 1960s, and before that, we have El Comalinguas, or Tongue Eater, which was harvesting the tongues from cattle in southern Honduras in the 1940s. Barry Fitzgerald has also noted cattle mutilation cases in Ireland related to the fairies as part of his larger studies of what I have dubbed the Phalian phenomenon. It's possible that we do have aliens or interdimensional beings or some sort of non-human life form performing animal mutilations at a steady rate throughout history, and that the mutilation boom of the 1970s was the work of military actors mimicking alien mutilations for the purposes of disguising the directed energy weapon testing. I still think the 1970s boom was the work of the military, but I'm open to the idea that other mutilations at other times in other areas were performed by some non-human entity. I also want to mention something as to why Manuel Gomez had such a rough go of it. In an FBI file, we see at least three separate mutilations of his cattle. 
It seems like lightning striking twice for one rancher to have so many incidents in one year when there were only about 10,000 total mutilations over several years, several states, and millions of heads of cattle in the western United States. In my research, I came across the claims of Phil Schneider. He claimed to be a whistleblower who worked for the military as a geologist in the building of a secret underground military base in Dulce, New Mexico, the same town of 2,500 people where Manuel Gomez lived. Phil Schneider also claimed that he was part of a group that found underground aliens in an underground cavern in 1979 when they were digging for the military base, and that there was a shootout between the aliens and the feds that led to the deaths of 60-ish feds. Schneider later died mysteriously of an, uh, <clears throat> suicide, but no one has corroborated Schneider's claims, and Schneider himself was the son of a German U-boat pilot brought over as part of Operation Paperclip. I'm taking many, many grains of salt as should you, but I did find it interesting that such a small town came up multiple times in my research. That's going to wrap it up for this week's episode. Thank you for stopping by my mental laboratory of sorts. Until next time, may you never stop asking, what in the Sam Hill? <laughs>